as we continue our series looking at the book of Ezra. Project Rebuild is what we've entitled this series. So have it open, page 700 and, so, sorry, page 474, Ezra chapter 3. And I uh, just want to start off by talking a little bit about this programme. I don't know if you've come across it, I've seen bits of it, but apparently it's a real phenomenon. Uh, someone, some, uh, a journalist described it as chicken soup for the soul. Comforting and warm and feel good. And uh, the, the basic premise, it's been going on for about four years now if you've not seen it. It's, uh, these are the words that advertise it. Enter a workshop filled with expert craftspeople, bringing loved pieces of family history and the memories that they hold back to life. The repair shop will resurrect, revive and rejuvenate treasured possessions, is how they market that. And there's some quite moving things that have happened. Uh, the widow of a man called Jim brought in an ornate box that he'd brought with him to the UK uh, when he got to, kind of taken on the kinder transport, a mission to rescue children from Europe and from the Nazis. Uh, and he kind of escaped that, and, it, and this box got uh, repaired. It was really moving to see uh, that widow's response. There was an Italian chair that was brought in, uh, that a daughter brought in that uh, reminded her of her late mum because she always used to sit in that chair. And so when that was repaired, there were sort of evocative memories that came as well. Childhood toys that were destroyed and then repaired and resurrected and rebuilt. And so have those kind of pictures in your mind, because as we come to Ezra 3, God is doing this through his people on a much bigger scale. He's restoring his loved people, his treasured possession. Did you notice that phrase in the repair shop? to new life. And we see in this chapter the altar being rebuilt and the start of the temple being rebuilt as well. And lots of emotions and memories evoked as well. So let's read chapter 3 together. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people had assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of, Z Z Z I knew I was going to get this wrong, Josadak, and his fellow priests and Zerubbabel, son of Shelatil, and his associates all uh, began to build the altar of the Lord God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what's written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both morning and evening sacrifices. Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with the required numbers of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those bought as a free will offering to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. They gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorised by King Cyrus of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shelatul, Joshua, son of Josedach, and the rest of the priests, the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites and all who returned from the captivity to Jerusalem began their work. They appointed Levites 20 years, old and, 20 years old and older to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Candio and his sons, descendants of Hodavach and the sons of Henedad and their sons and brothers, all Levites joined together in supervising those working on the house of the Lord. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by King David of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, his love, he is good and his love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who'd seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. 
No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. So for the last 70 years, as Tom reminded us last week, these people that we've been reading about had been away from the land that God had provided for them after supernaturally rescuing them from slavery in Egypt. They'd been forcibly removed from their, their homes, from the, the Jerusalem, the city where the temple was, the temple which was designed to be that specific access point, that encounter with the holy gods, the city which lay in ruins. And for 70 years, these people have been surrounded by other gods, other temples, other people worshipping in all kinds of different ways. And all this was because of their disobedience, their neglect of God's word and God's ways. And as so, Tom so helpfully explained last week, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we saw a new king come into power, a new super force, which had a different response and way of handling those who were under their authority. And he allowed and encouraged the people to come back to their homes and so we pick up chapter 3, more than 40,000 people have walked probably for three or four months and are finally standing in the rubble of Jerusalem. God's people, who'd been called to be a distinctive community, came together and they stood in the rubble and the ruins of Jerusalem where the temple once stood and they started to worship. It's quite a powerful picture, isn't it? And though the circumstances may be different, as I said a couple of weeks ago, it does feel right now for us in this country a little bit like we're exiles. The world has changed around us. It feels less like home. And some of us may feel we're standing in the ruins of what church was in this country. Some of us look around and see the brokenness. So what's God saying to us at this moment in this time, collectively and individually? through this chapter, through the people of God and what they did then. Because I believe God has some things he really wants to speak into our hearts and minds and lives to reshape and remake us as we respond to his voice today. And before we look at four particular aspects of the worship of the people of God at this time from this chapter, I just want to uh, point out three things which I really hope will help us that we come to in those first couple of verses. The first is the word settling. Look at verse one. For three months since they've arrived back, we're told the people settled in their towns. Now, settling's an interesting word, isn't it? Is settling down a good thing or a bad thing? If a guy's had kind of a, a bit of a, a dodgy relationship history, people go, oh, it's about time they settled down. And sometimes we see settling down as a really positive thing. But settling down isn't so good if it means that we're doing less than what God wants or if it means we're so comfortable we don't obey his voice or we refuse to step out in faith. And the settling here later, the prophet Haggai, and it's great that Tom's going to be looking at that and going deeper, this kind of parallel uh, kind of prophet, similar kind of time. He, he really berates the people because they stopped rebuilding God's house but they furnished their houses. Haggai 1.4 says, is this a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house, talking about the temple, remains a ruin? And so, so God's people have a, have a danger to settle and stay comfortable and not do the things that God wants them to do to build what he wants them to build in the rubble of Jerusalem. Settling. And then timing. Look, look at verse 1 here. There's things that we miss here. This was a key time. It's the holiest month of the year, September, October. It's like their new year, the Jewish new year. The first day is the year of new beginning of this month. Ten days later, there's the Day of Atonement, the most significant day for God's people, the day when they remember and celebrate their sins being removed through sacrifices. Five days after that is the Feast of Tabernacles, a week-long festival where the Jewish people remembered uh, God's rescue of them and their, their deliverance from Egypt and their wandering in the desert as well. This was a time of new starts and so we need to see that as well. And then lastly the third word in just in terms of an introduction is the word worshipping. This is a chapter all about people worshipping. 
And the truth is that we all worship something or someone. God has made us as humans to be a worshipping people, to give out our time and our devotion and our attention and our interest into something or someone. And the question isn't for each of us, are we worshipping, but who are we worshipping? And do they, do they deserve our love and attention and focus? And maybe for you, as you sit here now, or you're catching up with this later on YouTube or watching on Zoom, the question for you this morning is about who you're worshipping, what you're investing your life in, what demands your t attention. Is, is, it, is it that next career move? Is it that bigger house? Is it getting more money to be comfortable? Is it being popular? Well, what is it that, that demands your time and your attention that you worship? And we see here people worshipping God. Worshipping God together. We see it was a daily thing. Daily sacrifices, morning and evening. And just to flip to us as we sit here now, our worship, our temple is this. Our body. Paul says very clearly, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So wherever we go, we're called to be worshipping. And we do it together, collectively. That's important we do that and not neglect that as church. But we also do that every time we go anywhere in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces. Uh, and when we're coaching football, like Mike was sharing about last week, in all of our relationships, we are worshipping. Romans 12, Paul makes it really clear, doesn't he? He says, offer your body as a living sacrifice. And we'll come back to that at the end of our time together. So I just wanted to start off by just, just fixing on those three words. And then let's move on together to look a little bit at the specific worship that went on in, the, in this rubble of the city of God, Jerusalem, as they've come back home. So look at verses one to two. There's a lovely phrase here. The people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. There's a wonderful picture of unity and it's easy to fly past this phrase without stopping and remembering the fragmented nature of these people. Twelve tribes, two divided kingdoms. There's not a great track record of this group of people being whole, being united. But that phrase makes it very clear they were. The people assembled together as one is a really powerful, strong expression of unity. One people, one purpose. And the true worship of God brings people together and demonstrates and expresses unity. One people, one purpose. Jonathan Wilson in his book, Why Church Matters, says this. The activity of worship, glorifying and enjoying God, is the central practice of the church. It is this practice that most clearly sets the church apart, that most clearly displays our calling and constitutes the church as a community. And so, as I hope I've made clear, when I'm talking about worship here, I'm not talking about a block of three songs that we do at the start of a service. I'm not talking about the time that we gather. It includes that, but it's our whole lives. And when we do gather to worship, so often we hear of worship wars, of disunity, of division. We've been struggling a little bit as a church, haven't we? In the last few weeks with this. And worship is supposed to express our unity, not to expose our disunity. And so what can you and I do to ensure that as we gather together, we are expressing that unity that we have in Jesus? Let's be very practical. I think as we come, we need to focus on what we give to God rather than what we get. I think preparation helps. How can we prepare our hearts as we come? Being other orientated. How do you want to use me today, God, to build up your bride? My church family to serve, to offer to pray for someone, to share a God story, to share that nudge of a word that I think you might have given me for somebody. Worship develops and demonstrates unity. And we see that really clearly here. Assembled together as one. And let's move on. Because there's another fantastic phrase here in verses 3 to 7. Worship despite fear. Um, I have always, I'm not, I've shared this with you before, but I've always been a bit frightened of swimming. For someone who's a PE teacher, that's not a great uh, thing. We didn't have a PE, we didn't have a swimming pool in my school, which was quite good. Because I've always been a bit frightened as a kid and also as an adult of kind of swimming and being out of my depth and all that. I can swim all right. 
but I'm always on the edge of being a bit nervous. And when we were on holiday a little while ago, uh, we came to this place where there was a quite a kind of deep lagoon, and uh, the kids went in and they snorkeled, and it was really like, proper deep. And, and I had that kind of battle of going, I want to go and see the things that they've just seen, and they're coming back telling me about all these amazing fish, but my heart's racing, I'm thinking, oh, I hate being at my depth. And you kind of got that thing of going on, what do I do, what do I do? I'm going to miss out on that, but I want, it's the fear thing. I did snorkel in the end, and I loved it, and I've uh, been back there a few times. But even when I'm swimming, I'm feeling the fear. I don't know if any of you can relate to that in your own life. I mean, you can practice examples like that. And here we see the people of God worshipping, here's the phrase, despite fear. Despite the fear. Start of verse 3. Despite their fear of all the nations around them, they built the altar on its foundation and they sacrificed, they worshipped. The phrase here means terror inspired by man. That kind of fear. And there were lots of reasons for them to fear. In a city that now had a bunch of other nations living there who worshipped different gods in different ways. In the middle of hostile neighbours, they were to erect an altar and sacrifice on it to the one true living God in front of everybody. And that kind of worship demands boldness, doesn't it? We are different to the prevailing culture around us. We should be living our lives to a different drumbeat. We worship a different God. We are called to be different and distinctive. Hear me right, not deliberately weird. And some Christians have a gift of weirdness. Not deliberately weird, but we're called to live distinctive lives despite fear. To worship God despite fear. We have some other brilliant examples, don't we, of, of people who worship God despite fear. Gideon pulling down the idol, even though he did it at night, he still did it. Daniel. Continuing to pray, despite the king's edict that anyone would pray would then be thrown into a pit of lions. So certain death, unless God intervened, which he did in that case. Peter, hearing God's call to leave the boat and to walk on water and do the impossible in God's strength. And so there's examples here in this church family of many of you worshipping despite fear. Here's just a few, and I won't mention names but here's just a few that I've come across in the last few weeks. A teenage girl telling her friends at school that she goes to church and loves Jesus and, having, and being persecuted as a result of that. Worship despite fear. So much easier to say nothing. Just to go under the radar. A uni student trying to explain why they won't have sex with their Christian girlfriend to the open mouth shock and horror of all their non-Christian friends who think they're proper weird. The teacher who won't join in with the verbal assault on the head teacher in the staff room, but instead speaks to them directly if they've got issues. The social media user who tries to portray reality, not just the airbrush stuff, who gently questions rather than aggressively reacts. The retired person who instead of using their time to do what they want and enjoy a comfortable life, continues to give and to serve. Worship despite fear, there's loads of it that goes on. And as these verses go on, look at verses 4 to 7. You can see there's a real attention to detail here. Twice he talks about as it's written. And so the people of God are, are starting to learn their lesson. They're fearing God more than they're fearing people. They want to follow God's instructions clearly into, into the detail. Because they see that the reasons what, that what's happened as a result of not doing that. Is all around them, the rubble of the temple, if they needed any evidence. And so despite their fear, they build an altar, they offer the sacrifices that God had instructed them, and the first time for 50 years in that city that happened. Fear so often chokes our worship when we gather to. What will people think of me if I express myself in that way? Fear if I get that nudge from God, it might be wrong. Fear of asking someone to pray for me, what will they think of me? Fear of dealing with that baggage that I've been dragging around with me for years, decades even. Worship despite fear. And then thirdly, look at verses 7 to 9. So much in the news recently about the cost of living, isn't there? Uh, which is impacting all of us. There's a cost to worship too. And so the people get started on the temple. Verses 7 to 9 here. About 20 months later, 
exactly 70 years after the first deportation, people were leaving the city. They are starting to rebuild the temple. It's a great moment. But notice that it was costly. They gave money to the masons and carpenters. Lebanon was renowned for its cedars. God, uh, in the first temple, in, it gave very clear instructions and they wanted the best to build the temple to honour and glory God. I was chatting to uh, my neighbour who went to the um, service at the cathedral uh, and he said it was really good but there's lots of pomp and ceremony and there's a lot of money floating around there and it's an, an interesting reflection of how we, how we are now with the money that we have. But they used the best there, the cedars. And so they had to, to buy the materials, which cost money. The people had to work, which cost time and energy. And it's not a surprise that our worship, when we gather and when we scatter, is costly. It demands something of us. To make that decision to praise God, even if I really don't like that song. To plan your financial giving so that you stay having a generous heart and you push away the pull of greed. It's costly. Taking time to make that meal for someone or think about the words that you're going to write in a card or a text to someone just so that you can bless them and encourage them. It can be costly. Standing up for those who are unfairly treated in the workplace or across our world may mean that you're ostracised at work. Looked over for that promotion. It can be costly. Investing into the daily spiritual practices that we need to to stay connected to Jesus so that we can stand and keep going against the, the, the thrust of the world and the flesh and the devil which is trying to drag us down is costly. Charles Spurgeon, the famous Baptist preacher, said this, it's our duty and privilege to exhaust our lives for Jesus. Worship is costly. And don't miss this, because there's echoes back here to the building of the first temple. The same materials. Work starting on the same day of the same month. The same musical instruments being used. And even the same words used to celebrate. He is good and his love endures forever. And that's significant as we move on. But worship is costly. It costs and then finally, what I think we can see from the people of God worshipping here together in chapter 3, this significant moment, is worship demonstrates joy and weeping. There's an ongoing question at the moment in our political world, when is a party not a party? And you have a different answer based on your perspective. Here this moment was definitely a party. Unashamedly. Let me read the verses again to you, verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And so this moment was unmistakably, unapologetically a moment to celebrate, to sing and to dance. Trumpets were mainly used to call people together for joyous occasions. Voices were raised, there was responsive singing going on, praising God for this moment that was finally here. Hope for all that would come. A moment to celebrate. But, look at verse 12. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who'd seen the former temple wept aloud. And when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy, no one could distinguish the sounds of the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. What an interesting picture of the mix of emotions going on at this moment of celebration. At the same time. That God is being lifted up in an outburst of praise by his people. There's a spontaneous cry of disappointment. The older ones who would have remembered the glory days of the old temple realised that some of those things that made that temple precious, that first temple, the ark, 
the tangible sense of the presence of God containing the Ten Commandments that God had written on stone to Moses. Not there. The glory cowed, which came and meant the priests couldn't carry on. They were back from exile, but they were still not free. And so that realisation broke their hearts. What was before them was nothing like the past, nothing like the hopes that they had. And they wept bitterly. In contrast, the younger ones who had no frame of reference concerning those old glory days were excited about what God was doing and were wanting to celebrate all that was going on. Apart from the reality that Stephen's already expressed at the start of our service, that when we gather to worship, there will be some who feel like weeping and some that feel like celebrating. I think there's something deeper going on here that we need to finish with and to carefully explore. It's really easy to look back, to compare, to be disappointed and not to get excited about what God is doing in the present. It's really easy to do that. Whether that's in a previous church, whether that's a previous time of history of the church, or whether it's a previous time in this church. Whatever you think the golden age is. And it can sometimes lead us to feeling despondent or even despising what God is doing in the present. And God had something to say about this to the people. Listen to God's word later as they, they start to look at what God's doing in the ruins. Zechariah 4.10 says this, this God speaking clearly, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hands. And then in Haggai once again, ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I'm with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you, do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says, in a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Let me share a little bit personally, if I can. For us, six and a half years ago, uprooting from the southeast where we've lived all our lives and coming to Gloucester was a massive deal. We left the church we loved, our family and friends, to arrive in a place where we knew no one. And for the first few weeks, I would phone people back home, longing to hear their voices on a daily basis. For the first few months, I would unfavourably compare all of you with the church that I'd known and served in for 20 years. And unsurprisingly, you didn't match up. I was struggling. I spoke to my mentor and I told him about some of these struggles. And I remember telling me this story, which has still stuck to me today. He said, when, when, when a ship sets sail for a new place and people relocate to a new home, something happens on that journey. Often people are at the back of the boat and they're looking at the shore that they're leaving and they're waving goodbye. But there's a moment on that journey when they move from the back of the boat to the front of the boat. And they start to look ahead to the shore that's coming. And so I ask you, as I ask me, where were you on the boat? Because I have to be really honest and say, we can't go back. We can't go back to whatever golden age we think in the time of the church in this country. We can't go back to Hillview Church 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Actually, for the record, I don't think there ever was such a golden age in the church or this church. There's always been blind spots in different generations. No mention when I was growing up of creation care. No real grappling sometimes with issues of injustice. There are blind spots then and there are blind spots now. But what we can do is commit our lives to God once again, to be tools in his hand, to build his kingdom going forward into the present and into the future, making the most of the opportunities that God has given us now. Worship demonstrates joy. 
This chapter is a story of hope. The worship of God when we're gathered and when we're scattered, God remaking us, God using new beginnings to establish his people once again in the rubble and ruins of what had been Jerusalem. It was a good start. And it was to be celebrated. Yes, it was a stop-start project as we'll come to. It took 15 years for them to get going again when God spoke through the prophet Haggai. Yes, it didn't lead to God being present like he was before. Because God was speaking in those words that I read from Haggai of a greater glory, a perfect peace to come, a complete exile from slavery, not to a superpower like Persia, but to the destructive power of sin in the arrival of Jesus, God's Prince of Peace. The one who would come and live as one of us and die instead of us and live again so that we can always be with him. 